La Asamblea escuchará ahora The Assembly will hear an address by His Excellency Evo Morales Aima, President of the Plurinational State of Bolivia. I request protocol to escort His Excellency. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much, Brother President of the General Assembly of the United Nations. I wish to greet the Secretary General of the United Nations and all the presidents, heads of state, delegations, international organizations from across the world. My special greetings to those attending this uh, general debate of the United Nations. As always, we are here to share experiences of leadership, of work for life, humanity, equality, and social justice. But we are also here to express our deep differences on life, peace, democracy, which I have been listening to over the past few days from some powers which leave a lot to be desired when we talk about liberty, equality, dignity, and sovereignty as well. Brother and sister presidents uh, present here today, thanks to the consciousness of the Bolivian people, I'm now in my eighth year at the, in the presidency. In my almost eight years as president, in spite of the economic and financial crises of some so-called developed and industrialized and even exaggeratedly industrialized countries, because some power is industrialized simply to put an end to life, in Bolivia we have economic growth of 4.8% on an average. Previously, it was just over 2% with the economic policies of the free market and neoliberalism. This year, economic growth is estimated at 6% at least. We are doing well. Thanks to this economic growth, I would be, like to tell the United Nations that the Millennium Development Goals have reduced poverty. We have met the, the Millennium Development Goal of reducing extreme uh, poverty and the United Nations data for 2011 where one million Bolivian men and women uh, entered the middle class. Bolivia has 10 million inhabitants. One million inhabitants entered the middle class and what this means is 10% of uh, Bolivia's inhabitants have improved their economic position. Undernutrition of children under five has decreased. We have exceeded the Millennium Development Goal of the United Nations. Uh, the rate of literacy for the population between 15 and 24 years of age uh, was uh, met. UNESCO had declared Bolivia a country free of illiteracy thanks to the cooperation of Cuba and Venezuela who have been working with us on this goal since 2007. The coverage of maternal health uh, has been reached uh, as well as uh, a decrease in mother and child mortality. We have created uh, bonuses for uh, pregnant uh, sisters and also for children under two years of age, which has made it possible to, uh, see, to see a decrease in maternal and child mortality. We have a program with more investment for water. It's called My Water. I must thank uh, the Inter-American Development Bank for its contributions. We are now in the third program with $300 per municipality in rural areas and this has made it possible for us in some municipalities to uh, provide 100% of uh, 
these municipalities with drinking water. I've just come from a major activity in the Department of Santa Cruz. I visited two municipalities. In two of them, the mayors told me that they are not uh, mayors uh, belonging to the party in power. With my water three, 100% of the populations of those towns will have drinking water. So I'd like to tell you that investment in water is a blessing for life. Investing in water means getting rid of disease because drinking water make it, makes it possible for the population to avoid contracting diseases. Dear brothers and sisters, I would like you to know that we have been able to achieve this thanks to a state that lives in sovereignty with dignity. Why am I saying this? Uh, previously, politically, we were subjected to uh, the North American Empire. The, um, uh, the embassies of the United States were those making the decisions even about who was going to be a minister. We were subject to the International Monetary Fund economically. Si uh, since we arrived, we said enough subjection both to international organizations and to the embassy of the United States. Previously, for any credit, the International Monetary Fund uh, uh, set conditionalities and it blackmailed the various governments. And the blackmail, the conditionalities, were for us to give up our natu natural resources to transnational companies so that Bolivia would privatize uh, basic uh, services. Uh, just imagine uh, brother president and sister presidents here. Basic services are human right, and it cannot be private property. Property. So when we freed ourselves politically and uh, economically, we are now doing better. One of the policies we adopted was precisely to nationalize hydrocarbons, gas and oil. Uh, I want you to know, just to let you know, uh, share a small experience with you. Previously, contracts with uh, uh, transnational said uh, the bearer has acquires a right uh, to property at the mouth of the well while we union leaders were saying why are gas and oil not property of the Bolivians they said yes as long as it's under the ground it belongs to Bolivians once it's out of the ground it no longer belongs uh, to Bolivians they invented this business of the bearer of title uh, of the uh, petroleum companies, and they acquired property at the mouth of the well. Of, out of all property, 82% uh, was for transnationals, especially mega oil fields, and 18% was for Bolivians. It was pillage. It was robbery. Since we nationalized hydrocarbons, I must say that we have really begun to improve the economic situation and the social uh, conditions of our country. Just one example, brothers and sisters, uh, the sales uh, of oil uh, and some of the resources were $300 million before I took the presidency. Today, it's going to be more than $5 billion. Last year, we almost reached $5 billion. It continues to grow with the investment, and today, we have reached the stage of giving added value to these natural resources. I just want to share my experience with you. As you know very well, I'm not an expert either in uh, politics or in economic matters, but at the request of the Bolivian people, I am here, learning daily on the basis of the needs, the problems, and the demands of my people, the people of Bolivia. Besides that, I would like you to know that the, this the work we do together with social organizations, which are organized representatives of the people, is going very well. I would like the United Nations and the Secretary General to know that through directive, we are working on the patriotic agenda for 2025. What exactly is this patriotic agenda for 2025? 
Bolivia was uh, established in 1825, and in 2025 it will celebrate 200 years of its existence as a republic, which is now a plurinational state. And we are working with all the social movements and all of the authorities, uh, local uh, governments and uh, provincial governments, so that there will be a long and med a medium and long-term plan which will make it possible to guarantee the future of the generations to come. Brothers and sisters, I would like, besides local issues, there are also regional issues. Bolivia and Chile, the gateway to the sea with sovereignty uh, to, uh, over the Pacific Ocean. In 1879, on February 14, there was an invasion. The invasion began on February 14, 1879. And on the 23rd of March of that same year, there was a, a slight resistance. Who invaded us? The Chilean oligarchy of the time, with British companies backing them up. We lost our door to the sea. And there were so many meetings from then on. Uh, there was a treaty, but it was an imposed treaty, an unfair one, and it was not complied with even. I just want you to be aware of the following, brothers and sisters here today. Uh, with so, after so many meetings with uh, other presidents, uh, a meeting with the brother president of Chile, we tried to reach an understanding, but there never has been an official proposal to that uh, irrevocable right of the Bolivian people to return to the Pacific with sovereignty. What did the president of Chile say in September 2010 when he spoke to the General Assembly of the United Nations here in New York? He said, treaties are inviolable and they must not be touched. On the 28th of uh, January 2013, during the summit of the economic uh, community, um, in Santiago, Santiago Pinel said the following, of course, treaties can be perfected. First he says it's untouchable. Then he says it, it's, it can be improved upon. What this means is, it, is that it lies heavily on his conscience and something has to be done about it. From 2010, in uh, 2012, Pineda said, Chile will respect not only the treaties it has signed, but also its sovereignty with all the strength in the world. But on the 28th of January 2013, during the summit of ACLAG in, in Santiago, Pineda said that sovereignty cannot be touched except because of economic interests. On the 22nd of September 2011, at the General Assembly of the United Nations, President Pineda said, between Chile and Bolivia, there are no ongoing territorial issues, but uh, in January 2013, in, in an interview with the Tercera Chilean newspaper, he recognized the following. Chile has offered Bolivia autonomy in a territorial uh, enclave. In other words, he, he's trying to resolve the issue, but this proposal has never been made officially. A fourth contradiction, the 11th of November 2012, at the Ibero-American Summit in Cadiz, Spain. The president of Chile said that Chile will demand that a valid treaty, the Treaty of uh, 1904, be respected, and any conversation about this must be bilateral in nature. It does not belong in a multilateral forum, such as that in which we are participating today. The 2nd of February 2013, what did the President of Chile say? He said, the possibility of an exit to the sea without sovereignty through Arica will come to an end if Peru wins uh, its case at The Hague. Another contradiction in June 2013, President Sebastián Pineda said, Chile has the right 
and it will strongly defend the conviction. It will defend its territory, sea, and sovereignty with strength and conviction. And Chile is a country which knows that it will never bend in the legitimate defense of its territory. In June, he said that Chile will not cede to the Bolivian uh, uh, position, even though President Morales continues uh, to discredit him. He, he also said, naturally, we will respect the, Hague's, uh, uh, the, the Hague decision. Chile respects decisions of, of the Hague. Brothers and sister presidents, I simply wanted to tell you, to avoid uh, conflict, Bolivia is a peaceful state. Uh, it has lived in peace since the refoundation of the plurinational state. With great respect, I wish to inform you that we went to the international courts. We have requested uh, the International Court of Justice to declare the obligation that the Republic of Chile has to effectively negotiate in a timely fashion and in good faith uh, an exit, a uh, sovereign uh, outlet to the Pacific to maintain Bolivia's rights uh, to the sea. I want you to be aware that this uh, case cannot be interpreted or seen as an act of hostility. Quite the contrary. It is a demonstration of respect and confidence, the confidence that Bolivia has uh, in uh, the mechanisms for the peaceful settlement of uh, international disputes. You can imagine how much dam damage we suffered economically, geographically, and the damage done to the people of Bolivia by this invasion of 1879 to uh, past and present and future generations. Our grandparents continue to ask us, when are we going to go back to the sea? Because Bolivia was born with uh, an outlet to the sea, to the Pacific. Uh, we are seeking a solution, a peaceful solution to this dispute. Brothers and sisters, Over the past few days, we have uh, heard uh, different uh, statements. We, it is not possible to listen to every single one of them. And uh, I want you to know that while we work to reduce extreme poverty, we are also working for peace with social justice. Nevertheless, uh, a, a handful of powerfuls promote the wars armed conflicts, military intervention, without respecting even the wishes of international organizations. We have heard these statements of freedom, democracy, peace, justice, security at this forum. As peoples who have been exploited, marginalized, uh, pillaged when it comes to our natural resources uh, by the empires of the time, we wonder what uh, democracy, what peace, what social justice some presidents who come here are talking about. when you see uh, presidents uh, and uh, their retinues blocking airspace, not providing guarantees uh, for attendance to this forum, for example. When they speak uh, uh, of democracy, how can they mention it when the espionage services of the United States violate human rights, the privacy, and the security of other states uh, using private companies, not only do they spy on democratic governments, but even on their own allies, their own citizens, and the United Nations itself. Well, fine, uh, let them spy on anti-imperialist presidents if they want, but spying on the United Nations, spying on their allies? I feel that there is a lot of uh, uh, overweening arrogance against uh, the rest of humanity. So we continue to look at this. Not only do they spy, they also hatch uh, 
coup d'etats. What peace can we speak of when military spending sacrifices the human rights of our peoples? How is it possible? Uh, and I'd like to ask the people of the United Nations, how is it possible uh, when there are so many unemployed for your government, for your president to spend $700 billion on the, on the military? It is not possible for these huge amounts of money to be spent on the military and on espionage when there are so many brothers and sisters in the United States without homes, without jobs, without schooling. I, can, I simply cannot understand how they can spend so much money to interfere in other countries while leaving their own unprovided for. Mention is made of human rights when uh, torture is carried out in uh, military bases of the Middle East, uh, in uh, the Guantanamo prison, union leaders uh, or political leaders who do not share the views of uh, uh, imperialism and capitalism are also tortured. They cannot be believe that they are masters of the world. They are mistaken. And beside that, They sign agreements, but they don't sign some of the most important treaties in the world. They do not respect United Nations resolutions. The security of the empire and the fight against terrorism have become the best excuse, the best uh, tool for a military intervention on a unilateral basis. You do not uh, combat terrorism with more uh, military spending or by training more military forces. As far as I know, you fight terrorism with social policies, not with military bases. You fight it with religious tolerance, with more democracy, more equality, more justice, and more education. What country is free from problems? Of course, there are differences. The best thing to do is to provide means, even, even if uh, we don't all have the same economic policies. Capitalism wants to emerge from its crisis through war and armed intervention. We must ask ourselves, who benefits from the wars? Who distributes the natural resources after intervention? Whose hands do they end up in? The countries that have been invaded after bombings. Who's really governing the United States? That's what I'm wondering. The citizens? Or is it the companies that promote wars? At least from the outside, I'm, I'm not an ambassador living in the United States, but from the outside, it's uh, what we see is that those who finance uh, political campaigns, election campaigns, are bankers and uh, big businessmen. They are the ones setting policy. Those who govern cannot be mistaken, nor can, nor can they uh, be confused about the conflict in Syria. We naturally uh, vehemently disagree with the use of chemical weapons and weapons of mass destruction. But uh, who has uh, the greatest nuclear arsenal in their hands? Who invented chemical weapons? Who industrialized these weapons that put an end to, to human lives? At least uh, in my region, things are perfectly clear to us. We know whose hands they are in, where they come from, and who is producing them. Democracies do not wage war. What we are saying is that those who decide on the course of wars are the arms industry, the, finance, the financial system, oil companies, and uh, all of these are the plutocracy. Plutocracy has become the substitute for democracy. The rich and powerful decide on the future of the world. Not only is this a new uh, moment of geopolitical imperial dis distribution. I don't want to go back over 
how Latin America and the Caribbean were uh, uh, divided up uh, by some imperial powers of the time, as were Africa and the Middle East. The interest was not resolving issues of uh, poverty, democracy, and equality. The interest was rather the natural resources of those countries. And now, once again, they want to split it all up with military interventions and by putting in military bases. What is also being debated is the colonization of space. We've seen that in recent years. The masters of the world, those who believe that they are the masters of the world, have told us that their power has no limits and that they can intervene wherever they feel like doing so. So I wonder then what the United Nations are for. Why do we have treaties? Why do we have conventions? What use is multilateralism? Human materialism is welcome. Inhumane interventionism will be fought against by all peoples of the world. As a union leader from one of the most humiliated sectors in the history of Latin America, the indigenous uh, uh, people's uh, peasant movement. War is a business for capitalism. There cannot be peace without justice nor equality as long as the business of war has part of place. They trigger wars, they wage wars for their businesses. This is why I believe it is important at this event to uh, consider these issues in depth. Another dimension is the war against drug trafficking. With the efforts of the Bolivian people and the national government, even though some powers do not have a shared responsibility in the fight against drug trafficking because the drug market is in capitalist countries. After we got rid of the GEA with the national policies, and thanks to neighboring countries like Argentina, Brazil, and Chile, who I must thank for the joint work, uh, we have seen an improvement, a better way of uh, fighting drug trafficking than with the DEA. The United Nations has seen the reduction in drug trafficking in Bolivia, but it was not certified by the government of the United States. Who should we believe? Should, uh, I leave it up to you. Should we believe in the United States or in the United Nations? I felt uh, somewhat uh, insecure when it came to visiting the, the United Nations in New York. And we really should think about changing the headquarters of the United Nations, changing where it is located. The headquarters of the United Nations should be in a territory, in a state that has ratified all the treaties approved by the United Nations. As you're aware, the government of the United States never ratified treaties uh, having to do with human rights or the rights of Mother Earth. They don't guarantee visas. They don't guarantee oversights. My, solidar my solidarity with the President of Venezuela, Comrade Maduro. So, how can we be certain that a meeting of the United Nations here in New York is uh, secure. How do we feel safe? Perhaps some of us are, feel secure, but those who do not share the views of imperialism and capitalism feel completely insecure. And I just want to ask you, not out of fear, um, we, we should not, because of fear, uh, be complicit in such an arrogant attitude towards the peoples of the world. I don't know if we really believe in the United Nations if we don't respect resolutions. For example, the economic blockade of Cuba, there are only two or three countries who don't, uh, uh, who don't vote in favor of it. Most of us are we're perfectly aware of it, and we vote for the resolution, but it's not respected. So what's the point of coming to the United Nations? Besides that, 
I would like you to be aware that the United States harbors terrorists, criminals, and the corrupt. They escape from Bolivian justice in Bolivia, and they come here. They take, they take refuge here, and the United States does not help in the fight against corruption. So what kind of an agreement can we have to fight corruption? And besides that, they accuse governments, Cuba for example, that they promote terrorism. So how is Cuba going to come? Perhaps because of this kind of accusation, there are just uh, 60 or 70 presidents out of over 90 who come. This kind of uh, policy is going to exclude uh, presidents. Uh, what's the point of coming here if resolutions are not respected? This and many other reasons uh, should lead us to consider changing the headquarters of the United Nations. Bolivia in South America sees many neighboring countries that have ratified all the United Nations treaties, and that is where the headquarters of the United Nations should be. There's also blackmail when it comes for, to visas. I have to wait for a visa to be able to come and we get visas for four, five, or six days. That's it. What's the point of having that visa? You have to be here practically looking at one's watch, because if, we're, if we don't leave in time, they remove our visas. So we are terrorized and blackmailed through uh, the use of visas. If we are seriously discussing the life of humanity here, Perhaps we can share with some that we must seriously think of setting up a court of the peoples of major defenders of human rights to file a case against the Obama government. I was surprised that Obama, President Obama of the United States, started his mandate by saying, and I quote in uh, his uh, inaugural speech, I was elected to put an end to war. Those were his words. It was in newspapers, on radio, on television, and I said, this uh, brother president of the United States comes from a family that was discriminated against. Uh, we are going to agree. We are going to put an end to war. I was struck by this. Now we are seeing the exact opposite. Perhaps this is why, uh, well, we congratulated him when he got the Nobel Peace Prize. But basically it was the Nobel Peace Prize because it wasn't the Nobel War Prize. What are the reasons for a trial to be held? Crimes against humanity. The bombings in Libya. Tell us, tell me. Who did the oil in Libya belong to before? And who does it belong to now? At least the people of uh, Libya profited from its soil. Now who is managing it? What happened in Iraq? I'm convinced that behind any war, behind any intervention, what is happening is that they just take over natural resources. I've seen that myself in Bolivia. We recovered, uh, at least in Bolivia, we recovered our de natural resources democratically, not with bullets, but with votes, democratically, with the consciousness of the people of Bolivia behind us. For acts of international terrorism, financing of terrorist groups, uh, confrontation and uh, possession of weapons, have been the reason to bring uh, uh, those opposing them to trial. But now we are better off politically and democratically because we've put it into USAID, which was conspiring. We, are, we do welcome cooperation, but we want unconditional cooperation, not subject to conditionalities. We do not want to be subjected to having to privatize basic services or natural resources. 
Just imagine the damage done to a country by an economic blockade. It's the best form of genocide. If you're truly responsible for the life of human beings, if you're responsible for the truth, justice, and peace, we must organize so that never again, no president, nor in, neither in South America or in the Middle East or anywhere in the world, should be able to uh, damage lives and uh, their fellow human beings. Brother and sister presidents here today, I wanted to uh, tell you that previously we discussed the crisis, the economic crisis, the environmental crisis. Now what we're discussing is interventionism. As long as imperialism and capitalism exist, there will be neither peace, nor justice, nor freedom, nor dignity, nor sovereignty for the peoples of the world. I am convinced of that because I have uh, some experience in the matter. We must think of a world without oligarchies, without monarchies, without hierarchies, and besides that, we must think Uh, of the kind of leadership we want in the world. We all have sovereignty and dignity. No matter how small and backward our peoples may be, developing countries, as they call us, but whatever our situation may be, we have dignity and we have sovereignty. Now, this sometimes, uh, uh, sometimes the political class is harmed uh, by arrogance. And uh, as president, we must work against uh, these attitudes that harm the political class. Corruption and abuse of power. Our obligation is to change. Change the, the way uh, people do politics. In my experience, politics is not a business. It is not for profit. It is service. It is commitment to our peoples. If somebody thinks that uh, politics are a profitable business, they are mistaken and that president will not do well. If a government makes it possible for bankers, uh, the financial sector, the transnationals, and businesses run their countries, they are mistaken. Power must be in the hands of those democratically elected by the people, and thus participating in social forces for the well-being of our peoples. We salute the fact uh, that private property is uh, respected, but it is quite different when the private sector decide on economic policies for a chosen few. And with this uh, little experience that I have, I would like to ask all of you to fight economic policies that damage humanity, reiterating that as long as there is an empire and capitalism, the fight will go on. The people will continue to rise up and there will be no justice. If we can free ourselves of the empire and cap capitalism, there will certainly be peace with social justice. There will be sovereignty and there will be dignity for our peoples. Thank you very much.